Boston, and I work in Boston at Harvard, and I work for a part of Harvard that's called Harvard X, um, which sounds fancy, but it's really just um, Harvard's attempt at being kind of like cool and, um, I don't know, like space, obviously. But uh, we make online educational content that's free and accessible to everybody, um, and it's part of edX. How many of you guys have heard of edX before? Just like a show of hands. Okay, so most of you. How many of you have heard of MOOCs before? Okay, so um, there's been kind of a burgeoning, like ex exploding movement online um, of these things called massive open online courses, which were actually developed a long time ago, um, kind of in the, the, at the dawn of the internet, uh, as a way for lots of people to come together and teach each other different things and share skills and knowledge. And now it's uh, it's really big because a lot of universities have gotten on board and they're putting their courses online for free. And a lot of them are so big, they call them massive, there's upwards of 10, 20, 30,000 people who are registered and taking these courses. And there's communities around the courses, um, and Harvard X is one of those universities that's doing, um, doing this MOOC creation on a large scale. Um, and edX was actually founded by Harvard and MIT because they realized that higher education was kind of missing the boat when it came to the internet and how much power the internet had to bring people together to learn stuff. So um, they decided to come together and create this initiative to put a lot of courses online. So what I'm going to do today is kind of like a bunch of different things, but I make a neuroscience course for Harvard X, which is free, it's open, you can access all of the material, it's online. That's mcbadx.org or fundamentalsofneuroscience.org. MCB80 is just the course name at Harvard, which we, um, which we took on as our online course name. Um, so I'll talk about that. I'll talk about MOOCs in general, where you can kind of find uh, educational material to, to check out online. And then um, also uh, we're going to do a little experiment, which is an experiment um, using this spiker box, which is open source. You can build it yourself. It's similar to the EMG um, box or the EMG experiment that I think uh, you've been running here doing kind of fun stuff with that and we can talk about this a bit later but basically what we're going to do is listen to some neurons firing in a cockroach and then we're going to see how we can um, play around with electricity in those neurons um, in a fun way kind of in the reverse. Um, and all of the, the stuff that we're doing today we have videos and, and material and content on the MCBADX website so if you don't get it or you're confused or you want to look at it again or try it out yourself that stuff is online. So before I keep rambling more, I also just want to get a sense of who you guys are. So if you can just tell me your name, um, I don't know, maybe if this is your first time at the LA Biohacker space, and if not, what you've been doing here, and then why you're here today. Can we start with Mr. Switzerland? In this day. Yeah. Oh, my name is Edward. Uh... Cool, thank you. All right, guys. So. I'll just launch into this so we can start doing some hands-on stuff as soon as possible. Um, so first of all, so I'm just going to, for those of you who came in later, I'm just going to give a quick overview of the loop landscape. So if you're not familiar with it, um, I'll show you some places where you can um, access these materials and show you what MCBADX, which is the neuroscience course that I make for Harvard, what we have to offer, and then we're going to listen to some spikes and, and talk about action potentials a little bit and do an experiment. So a couple of things, um, these are some of like the big places where you should go if you ever have any questions, not only about science or engineering, but also about the humanities. So edX is um, one of the bigger consortiums that is essentially like a MOOC platform. So these massive open online courses are produced within uh, universities within institutions and they are uh, partners with edX so they put all of their courses on edX and you can access all of the courses at the same time on the edX platform so other than you guys who said you were taking MCV edX have any of you ever taken any MOOCs or experimented a little bit okay just one person yeah okay so um, there are so many courses on edX that are really amazing and they're taught usually by kind of the star faculty from different uh, partner institutions. 
Some of them are not so good and some of them are better, um, but the great thing about it is they're all free, so you can access all of the course material. Most of the time, even when the course isn't actively running, so sometimes courses on edX will be like an archive of the course, and you can go in and watch lecture videos, um, you can do exercises, and when there are exams, you can get a certificate for the course. Um, and sometimes courses are only actively run, so you have to kind of register for them like you would a university course. Um, and then um, you can take the course with however many other people are taking the course. And in my experience, um, the, the numbers of people that you're going to see taking these courses are anywhere from like 1,000 people to 20 or 30,000 people, depending on how big the course is and sort of how popular it is. So uh, there's a really popular course at Harvard called CS50, which is an introductory computer science course. Um, although some people would argue it's not actually computer science, it's more like an engineering course, but that's kind of like a, a, another question. But um, it's a really fun course, and it's open all the time, and you can find um, all of their material online all the time, so they kind of have an open archive of the course. And they have a lot of events where you can go if you live on the East Coast, but they also do kind of like traveling um, uh, events as well. So there's a lot of like different variability in terms of the types of courses that you can, can take on edX. Um, and Coursera is another big platform for taking MOOCs. So if you can't find what you're looking for on edX, and there are hundreds of courses on edX, you can definitely find what you're looking for on Coursera. Um, the Coursera courses are like a little bit uh, more variable in terms of their quality because um, there are partner universities, but sometimes faculty will just get on board with Coursera and like teach a bunch of courses outside of their institution, and some of them are not as good, so you kind of have to play around and experiment. And um, from having run this neuroscience course that I've done now for two years, there's um, I, I, most of the people who are taking the course are taking it because they're curious, like you guys, um, and most people who tend to like go and sit through the whole course and finish it are doing it because they feel they have like a reason to do it. So they're either doing it because they want to apply to um, grad school and they want to catch up on some things that they know they're going to need there, or if they want to apply to university and they want to put it on their CV, which a lot of people are doing now in high school. So they're taking a bunch of edX courses or Coursera courses and putting down their grades. It doesn't count for anything, but it shows like, hey, I'm interested in this stuff that's not offered at my high school. I took these classes. Here you go. I can't vouch for whether or not that actually helps you get into college, but just like everything else, it's kind of like uh, showing that you're curious about the world. Um, but people who don't finish the courses, are it's not necessarily a failure. You can go in there. If you have a question about something, like if you have a neuroscience question and you can't answer it by looking for stuff on the internet or asking somebody you know who is a neuroscientist or has a biology background, you can go into these courses and find that information taught by university. So I think a lot of people, I always get surprised because I like live, live and work in this space, but a lot of people don't know about MOOCs at all, but they're, it's such a huge resource, it's, it's kind of crazy. Another thing that's been around for almost 10 years now is MIT OpenCourseWare. Have any of you guys ever heard of that before? Okay, a couple of you, yeah. MIT OpenCourseWare, I love because I used to go to MIT, and so uh, I think it's great, I think it's the best. But, uh, but it's also pretty cool because it's a complete archive of most courses that have been taught at MIT for 10 years. So they have like multiple years worth iterations of the courses. Um, they have lecture videos, they have all of the quizzes and all of the past exams. Um, and you can't get any credit or anything, but it's a huge resource. So if you don't know anything about physics and you want to um, refresh or you want to um, learn something about civil engineering because you're just curious, you can go and like take all the introductory classes that are up on MIT Open Courseware. So they were kind of like the original MOOCs, um, but not sort of um, given to people in a way where they were kind of like present. So this is just an archive, and these are more taught. So you have like, sometimes you can engage with the faculty members um, for these courses. And a lot of times there's, you're engaging with other people who are taking the class. So they're kind of different flavors of online uh, open courses. And probably most of you have heard of Khan Academy because it's a, California-based, um, still a nonprofit, although it's like it's growing pretty massively, kind of like a for-profit. But uh, they offer K through 12 courses as well, which is pretty cool. So a lot of the stuff on Khan Academy is categorized too according to um, 
at grade level and the types of courses that are taught in school. So if you are taking a, a class in middle school and you're like, I this is great, my teacher taught it, it's fine, but I kind of want to learn it a different way, you can go on here and find the exact curriculum, like the stuff that you're learning in class, and take lessons and interactive tools that will help you learn the concepts associated with that stuff. So um, this is a little bit better for uh, material that you're already learning in school, but that you want to kind of help yourself out with. And for those of us who are out of school, this is also really helpful as a kind of refresher and Stuff. And they actually have a really cool neuroscience course too um, on Khan Academy. It's just a different way of teaching. So I don't know if you guys have ever seen Khan Academy, but they have a lot of um, slides where people are talking over and like drawing at the same time. So that's kind of like a classic Khan Academy structure, whereas a lot of these other ones are like lecture videos. So it's kind of like watching a professor or a teacher versus watching somebody doing something. So whatever your, your style is. But there's so many of them that you have a lot of different options to choose from. Um, do any of you guys have any questions about MOOCs or like what you can do with this stuff? For those of you guys who tried it out, so you're in the middle of taking some classes now. Yes, yeah. yeah. So what do you think of them? You know what? Uh, the good thing about this is that you know you can't grasp the whole video in one take, so it, it's, it always helps out watching the video like at least twice, yeah. like, three times, mm -hmm. and that helps out yeah. because when you're like in a or let's say in a class, it's like teacher can repeat himself when there's like 20 or 30, you know, students in there. Yeah. Um, one of the things that you have a question in regards to MOOCs is, um, like the class I took at uh, the and Neuroscience, mm -hmm. there seems there's, there's not much interaction. Well, With Dr. Sun's class yeah. in Neuroscience and Vision, it seems like they're, uh, Claire, seems like she's really on it in regards to like, you know, yeah. interacting with the students and, you know, being active also on Twitter. Yeah. And uh, that's one thing I noticed the difference. There's a difference. Yeah, so it's, I mean, so part of that is because, so the fact to remember that we work, so David Cox is a neuroscientist and computer scientist who I work with to make this course um, at Harvard. And he is, he's really busy, right? So, I mean, the, there's, a, there's always an interesting, like, forward-facing part of these online courses, but then there's like the behind the scenes. So we wanted to make something that like could function on its own. If you have a course that's too dependent on uh, of somebody being there to like push people along, then it's it's used in a different way. So we wanted to make our course more like a tool that you could return back to and kind of. Um, and I don't know if you've played with any of the interactive segments that we have. In the yes, course. Yeah, so that was kind of our attempt at saying, okay, we're not going to always be here to kind of like answer questions, but here's a way for you to be able to play with some things in a way that's not just watching a video and then going on a forum or on Twitter or something. Because yeah, people do get discouraged. Like I've seen yeah. forums where people are like, well, nobody's here, so yeah. I give up and I quit. Yeah. And that's one thing I also read, I think it was in an article in regards to MOOCs, yeah. that a lot of people sign up and let's say 20,000 people sign up and all of a sudden like, you know, maybe a thousand people yeah. yeah, so that's what I was saying about like the number of people actually finish. So it's also a hard question now because a lot of people are looking at online education and they're saying like, oh, this is just going to be just like what we have in the university. Um, but personally, I don't think that that's how most people are using it. I think most people are using it like they use the internet. So like they're going and they're finding whatever small piece of information they need and then they're kind of leaving. Um, and for people who are using it like a course, I think it's, um, yeah, it can, I agree, it can be discouraging, but it's also like a balance. Like even when I'm talking to you guys now, like we have some folks who are in middle school, but then we also have like advanced learners, and so it's kind of like, I don't know, where do I pitch, where do I pitch it? Do I make it like a university course, or do I make it more like a tool, or do I make it more like a, like a K through 12 course? So it's, it's really hard, and I don't think anybody has like an answer to that at all. Um, but it's, yeah, it's something, like, we've noticed it too, um, like how do you keep people excited about this stuff, but also how do you recognize that not everybody is taking it because they want like a certificate and they want to finish. So, yeah, I can talk a little bit more when I show like some videos and stuff, well, stuff that we've tried to do, yeah. Yeah, that's another thing I wanted to ask is, um, FX Coursera and MIT Open Coursera, are they meant for people who are in middle school? Yeah, like, I mean, anybody can take them. So, like, if you want to take the course and you find that the level is too high, 
there's, that's probably going to be the case for like half of them, but the other half, it's probably fine. Um, and if you're already taking kind of advanced level courses in middle school or high school, some of them are going to be at a level where you can like find material online that works for you. But there's like, uh, in our course, we had, we had middle school students taking it alongside with like their parents or their grandparents, and then we also had, you know, like retired engineers taking it, and we had people with like no biology background at all who were doing some of the experiments like completely wrong, and then people, other people would help them in the forum. So there's, there's kind of different ways that we've tried to like make it so that everybody can participate, but it's very, it's hard because some, there's always many people who are like, I don't get this, like this, but that's the internet too, so. Uh, if you go on like any forum, it's kind of the same thing. Most of the people who take the time to write are like the angry ones. And then, um, <laughs> and then like you'll find some of the people who are like, this is amazing. So it's, yeah, it's a balance. It's, it's tough. But uh, um, yeah, I, I will take your feedback back to update. I mean, we, we try to, we try, but it's hard. When you have like 10,000 people also who are all are requesting different things, it's, we try to like integrate it. <laughs> but hopefully it works for, for, for some folks in some way. Um, so another thing that I wanted to talk about, I was going to talk about Experiment and then also SciStarter. Have any of you guys heard of this website? So some of what we've tried to do with our course and what a lot of um, courses are doing now, like MOOC courses are doing, are trying to empower people like you, like this hack space to do science yourself and to, like it's all great if you can watch a video, but it's much better if you can kind of get your hands dirty and try things out. So SciStarter is a really cool website that takes all of the DIY science experiments and citizen science experiments that are just out there and they categorize them according to like a content area, so if you're interested in um, genetics or you're interested in biology or you're interested in environmental science, they show you all, all of the, the experiments that are out there that you can do or participate in that are related to those different areas, and they break them down by grade level. So if you want to see, like, what can I do in sixth grade, and I'm interested in biology, it'll show you nationally, um, I think nationally, it might be international as well, all the experiments that are out there that you can play around with. So the stuff we're doing today is like a DIY science experiment um, that, um, there's a lot of material online for, but there's also citizen science experiments where you can do science uh, like iGEM, where you're actually creating new knowledge or helping to create new knowledge by collecting data or analyzing data. Um, and this is a really cool website for that. So um, that and experiment.com, which is this kind of Kickstarter for citizen science experiments are really, really nice things to, to check out. Um, and this is just like an example of one of the citizen science experiments that's on SciStarter, which is a little bit related to what we're doing today because we're working with cockroaches, but um, this is a, the National Cockroach Project, and so this uh, was a way to have lots of people participate in figuring out like what's the gen genetic diversity of cockroaches in the U.S. We know there are a lot of them, uh, but we don't really know about uh, what the differences are between cities, uh, what that variation looks like or that variability looks like, and so this was kind of a fun way for everybody to get involved in at least collecting data. Um, and the cool thing about synthetic biology and about, I think, a lot of citizen science is that there's still a lot of these big open questions about how we're doing things and what are like the sort of ethics and um, what, what does it mean for us all to be citizen scientists or what does it mean aren't scientists citizens too? I mean, all of these questions are kind of out there for us all to ask and I think that's really exciting. And um, I've forgotten your name already. Edward. Edward, okay. So even the questions that Edward was asking, like how are we supposed to be learning? Like is somebody supposed to be teaching? Am I supposed to be standing up here teaching you? Is somebody supposed to be teaching you? Or are you all supposed to be like, kind of learning together? Uh, I don't know if we have, I mean, we don't have the answers, so nobody has the answers to that, but I think everybody's also a little bit different, so if you can find things that are exciting to you, like this, or like kind of hacking um, electronics, or coming here and doing whatever, I think um, that's great. And with the internet, you can just find more of this stuff too, I think.